But we're trying. <laughs> Doing our best. Okay, That's technical all we can ask. difficulties. Come on. Let's see. Oh, oh, oh. And we are getting to the live. Okay. And we are now live. Oh. Whoa, Why do we look different? That way? This cool. is strange. But that's right. okay. okay, and now it's on this side. Cool. Interesting. Okay. Interesting, interesting. I think we're live. I think we are too. Whoop, nope, that's not what we want. Oh, <laughs> that just happened. happened. Cool. <gasps> we have three people! Hi! Hi. Hello, people. Awesome. Okay. I don't know what this is. Oh, that's oh, it's hard. Just okay. Hard. okay. We're learning technology. Whoop, as we do this. It's happening. Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody! We have five people so far. Perfect. <laughs> All right. We'll let people come on a little bit more. How many bugs can you guys spot on the screen? Type it in the comments. Because there's... I, I haven't even counted. How many bugs is there? One? Oh. <laughs> there's at least one, just so you know. Oh, I'm hiding some. Yeah, I think we both are. Actually, I... <laughs> I think I always get it twice, <laughs> so I don't know anymore. <laughs> I think I know, but that's okay. 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 That's not. Okay. So we have nine people. Awesome. Can everybody hear us? Can someone type in if you can hear us or not? I don't know. When we'll we had some comments. issues with audio last week, so we just want to make sure that before we start talking, you guys can hear us. Okay. okay. If for some reason throughout the video you stop being able to hear us, let us know, and we will start shouting. Yeah, I think I can. Uh, I know I can't. I can't change the mic without turning it off, but that's okay. All right, shall we? All right, I think so. We'll just get started with you five viewers. Hello, five viewers. We're super excited. My name is Katie. And I'm Emily. And I'm the Education Coordinator here at Zoo Montana. And I'm the Education Specialist. <laughs> Today, if you couldn't tell, we are getting buggy. We are going to talk about invertebrates as a group. And I'm just going to keep talking and telling you really cool things. When we were researching for this to make sure we had our numbers right, my mind was blown. So this morning, about 20 minutes ago, I put together a little visual for you guys so that you can actually see um, that we are, that, so that you can actually see what I'm talking about. Oh, hold on. Technical difficulties. Here we go. Cool. Okay. Anyway, so I put together a visual so we can talk about the numbers of invertebrates on this earth. It's really crazy and really cool. Okay. Now, we are going to talk about, okay, so, oh wait, you need real this. quick, I need to tell what an invertebrate is. Okay, just kidding. I'll be back with that. <laughs> Would you like to grab the, the spine? Oh, heck yeah. That's fine. <laughs> okay, my friends, so, an invertebrate is an animal that doesn't have one of these. Okay, so this is a backbone, right, and a little bit of hips there, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's totally what that <laughs> looks like. Okay, my friends, so basically invertebrates are just animals that don't have a spine, right? These are vertebra, the backbones, and... Vertebrates or invertebrates don't have one. They usually have an external hardened skeleton, though not all of them do. Um, and we are, if you didn't know, we are in this group. We are in the invertebrate. No. We are in the vertebrate group. <laughs> and surprisingly, there's a lot of us, right? There's about over 10,000 species of birds. How many species of mammals are there? A bunch. A bunch. I don't, of know, I don't know if that's I think it's head. like. It's a lot. 5,000? That sounds about right. Probably. Yeah, it's not as much as birds. It's in the thousands. There's a lot of um, reptiles and amphibians and fish, but vertebrates. <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> vertebrates, animals with a spine. There's only about sixty thousand known species of vertebrates, and I know that sounds like a lot, but we're about to talk about invertebrates, and um, right now. There are known to be about 1.25 million species of invertebrates. So, 60,000, 1.25 million species of invertebrates. Uh, and I had a hard time visualizing this, so we I put together this little thing right here. I put little beads inside our little test tubes here, and I'm going to read you the numbers of the different percentages of the species, right? So, 
the first one, 1% 1 of all animals on Earth are earthworms. So the uh, phylum, the group of earthworms is called Annelida, and there are about 22,000 species in that group. That's a lot of earthworms, okay? However, that's only, again, 1% of species. 2% is a combination of all of the small, uh, smaller groups of invertebrates. So there's sponges, which are animals, if you didn't know that, um, sea stars and sea urchins, jellyfish, flatworms, and sea squirts. <laughs> those are five different groups. Um, there's a bunch of, there's usually two to 5,000 in those groups, totaling 34,200 species. So that's about 2% of all animals is in those five groups. So there's not as many in those groups. Now we move up to 4%. So there's four little beads in there, which is the vertebrates, 60,000 species. So we make up only about 3 to 4% of the animals on Earth, okay? Which is wild. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Usually because we see these animals, we are these animals that have backbones, we don't realize how outnumbered we are until you start studying these things. So um, in the 5% category, the next one up, there are 70,000 species of snails, clams, squid, and octopi and their relatives. Those are the mollusks. Um, so that's quite a big amount. There's more of them than there are of us by about 10,000 species. And now we jump up to the huge numbers, okay? This big one that she's got her finger on right now is 35%. 35% of all living animals are in the nematode group, which includes hookworms, which are a major parasite. It's really gross to think about how many of those there are. And also the little threadworms that are often found in soils. So there's some really awesome ones in there and some ones that aren't so beneficial to humans in there as well. Finally, 52% of all animals 750,000 species are the arthropods. Crabs, insects, spiders, centipedes, millipedes, and barnacles, strangely enough. Yes, are in that group. arthropods. It's wild. Yeah. Super weird. So, if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will, because I am blown away by this. <laughs> like, again, 1%. Oh, other way. There you go. 1% on that end, 2%, 4%, 5%, and then 35%, and 52% of animals. I am blown away. Okay, so if you're not blown away, we're gonna keep going just to see if we can blow your mind some more. I wanna see if this will help. That's not helping. Nope. Okay. 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 So I think we're live. Okay. I hope people are seeing us. I think there's some people seeing us. If anyone can comment, let us know if you can hear us and see us, please do. Otherwise, we're just gonna keep talking and hopefully you can hear us later. Um, but, Anyway, invertebrates are grouped together despite um, major differences. Again, there's 1.25 million invertebrates and 60,000 vertebrates. We know those classes of vertebrates, right? We have the birds, we have the mammals, we have the fish, the amphibians, the reptiles. About five, yeah. Birds, there birds. we go. I said birds, I think. Fish, mammals, amphibians, reptiles, yes. Yeah. That's about right. Okay. <gasps> Yay! Thank you, Kylie. We appreciate it. <laughs> they, Facebook changed the uh, both the place of where our comments are and how the Facebook Live works. So, <gasps> hi, Megan. Yay! Hi, Megan! Hi. Yes, particles are so cool. They can live for up to like twenty years. It's what? something. Yeah, it's weird. What? Particles are great. Yay! Thank you, Sarah. Awesome. We're having some again. Facebook kind of mm, had a new thing going, so we're still trying to figure that out. But I'm really glad you can hear us. We're gonna keep going now. So invertebrates are grouped together simply by the fact that they don't have a backbone, even though there's 1.25 million known species of them. By the way, I was looking this up, and there may be as many as 30 million species of invertebrates, just ones that haven't been identified yet. So we are vastly outnumbered, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Um, the smallest invertebrates are things like tiny microscopic knights, or those like mites, or like nearly invisible flies, all the way up to the giant squid who has eyes the size of a soccer ball. So there's a lot of diversity in those groups. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on arthropods, which are bugs. And we've got several around the room, and we're going to introduce you to three live ones today. And I will go ahead and pull out the first one. Okay, cool. I will switch your spots. All right, here we go. <laughs> okay, so the first arthropod, oh, we're good, we're good. Okay, okay. 
The first arthropod that we're going to be talking about, um, they have a pretty teeny tiny like little enclosure here at the zoo, so it's possible if you've seen or visited us that you might have walked past them. Next time you come, please check them out. They're super cool, but they're also super hard to see, so you gotta, gotta focus your eyeballs. They are called our walking sticks, which Katie is bringing out right now. And this is a female. She's a fairly big walking stick. They can range from, you know, this big to being like the size of my fingernail. Um, and they are called walking sticks because they look quite literally like a walking stick. And this is part of their camouflage. So these guys live on every single continent with the exception of Antarctica. And they live in temperate and tropical forests. And they're arboreal insects, which means they're going to be spending most of their time in the trees. All right, and because it's so small, it's a prey animal for a lot of other animals like birds and some species of mammals, bats, uh, <laughs> reptiles, stuff like that. And so it's got to be able to blend into those trees very, very well, hence it looking quite literally like a stick. So in the enclosure that we have here at Zoo Montana, it's a bunch of sticks propped up willy-nilly within this habitat, and there's walking sticks throughout the whole enclosure. I think hundreds. Hundreds of these walking sticks. And when I first met these animals, it actually took me like two or three minutes to identify which one was a living stick and which one was just a dead tree stick. Like, their camouflage <laughs> is absolutely impeccable. It's insane. Let's see if I can find one that's not going to move as much. <laughs> okay. So these guys are arthropods, which means they have segmented bodies. Uh, that's one of the main characteristics of an arthropod is a segmented body. And if Katie can grab one out, that doesn't you know, move as much. She'll hold it up to the camera and you guys can see that segmentation very clearly throughout the walking stick's body. Now, these guys have a huge size range. Like I said, they can be anywhere from like one to two inches long to about 20 species, or 20 inches long. And there's one species, I think it's in Borneo, um, that is the 20 inch long species. Like when its legs are completely extended forward and backward, it is a whopping 20 inches long, which is absolutely insane. So uh, these guys are herbivores. They eat primarily leaves and um, have two of them right other now. plant matter. So Katie's got two of them on her arm right now. Hopefully you guys can get close enough to see their segmented <laughs> bodies. Um, but they eat primarily leaves and when they eat just like every other animal on earth, they gotta poop it out somehow and that poop actually feeds other insects in the rainforests and the temperate forests in which these animals live, which is pretty cool. Um, like I said, these guys are prey animals for a lot of species in these forests. Um, it's too small. So <laughs> camouflage is super important to them. The only animal that camouflage really doesn't matter for is bats, because bats hunt by echolocation. Oh. Um, and so they necessarily don't, the camouflage of the walking stick doesn't work super well against the bats, um, so bats are actually their primary um, source of mortality. Yeah, cool. yeah, bats are their primary source of mortality because their camouflage doesn't work against bats, which is pretty cool. So these guys, um, many insects will make a bunch of babies when they reproduce, and the way that these walking sticks reproduce is actually pretty cool. So they are one of the only species that has parthenogenesis, which basically means that the female walking stick can lay unfertilized eggs, and those unfertilized eggs will hatch into fully viable adult arthropods. Um, this doesn't happen in every species. I think one of the vertebrate species that can do this is the Komodo dragon, yeah. which is so cool. Um, but basically, the female walking stick, if there are no males around um, to mate with, she will lay these unfertilized eggs. The only catch is, any unfertilized egg that's laid is automatically a female. So if there are no male walking sticks around for a couple of years due to some environmental circumstance, or maybe males aren't surviving longer, maybe they're being eaten more by bats or something like that, you're going to have a population explosion of only female walking sticks. So there is a downside to this parthenogenesis. However, if there are males around and the female is able to lay fertilized eggs, there is a 50-50 shot that the fertilized egg will be a male. So just because the egg gets fertilized doesn't guarantee the sex of a male. Um, it's only if the egg is unfertilized that it's guaranteed to be female, which is so cool. Parthenogenesis is such a cool and crazy adaptation. It's absolutely wild. When these guys 
lay eggs, they look like seeds, and it helps to kind of disguise them from potential predators that are looking for an easy food source, right? Eggs don't move, they're fairly sessile, um, and they're not going to go anywhere. So if a predator wants to eat those eggs, it's a super easy buffet. Um, and so this they, one's acting like a stick. Beautiful. Oh, look at him go. Look at him be a stick. So it's, this insect is on the end of my finger, so she's trying to pretend to be a branch, and so she's not moving, and she's got her finger, her little arms pucked up, poked out. There we go. Here, I'll Look get it'll. a little move out of the frame a little bit so you can focus on it. There we go. There we go. Yeah, so right now she's exhibiting her camouflage behavior. Um, so she's trying to stay as still as possible so that if there's any potential predators in this area, that they won't be identified as a potential prey species. So this is what they look like most of the time in <laughs> their exhibit here in our building. Um, but back to their eggs. So depending on the amount of predators that live in the area that these walking sticks are in, females will lay their eggs differently. So if there's not a lot of predators, the females are comfortable laying all their eggs in one spot. However, if there are a lot of predators in the forest that they live, they will actually scatter their eggs throughout the forest. And by scattering their eggs, it increases the likelihood that some of those eggs won't be eaten by predators and will survive into adulthood, which is pretty cool. We often don't think of insects and animals like this as doing a behavior like that um, that would increase their survival, but they do. It's pretty cool. Um, so these guys are in the same order as leaf insects, um, and leaf insects look like leaves in the same way that stick insects look like sticks. There's actually 3,000 species of stick and leaf insects. They're wow. in the same group. There's 3,000 species of them. It's insane. Insane. <laughs> there are so many species of bugs, and this is just like one type of bug. So 3,000 leaf and walking stick insects. Do they live everywhere? They live on every continent with the exception of Antarctica and in the temperate and tropical forests on um, all six continents aside from Antarctica. That is really cool. Yeah. Um, so these guys, we're going to keep talking about how they're prey. Everything loves to munch them. Um, so they have a couple of anti-predator defenses to prevent them from being munched. Um, one of these is they play dead. Um, so they will just completely stop moving play dead. And hopefully that will, you know, lose the predator's interest and the predator will go on with its day and the stick insect will live another day. They also can drop limbs. So a couple weeks ago we had Stevie the leopard gecko up here and one of her cool adaptations was that she could drop her tail if a predator grabbed her tail. Well these guys can do the same thing but they can do this with their limbs. Um, better to lose a limb than lose a life. They also can emit a foul smelling odor so they can just get really stinky. I did a lot of Googling to try and figure out what the heck this odor smelled like. No avail, so I apologize. I cannot tell you the nasty smell that these bugs will emit, um, but they can emit a nasty smell when they're threatened. And I think we have a couple comments. Oh, cool. Let's see, let's see. Oh, no, just kidding. Hi, Nyoka, thank you. Um, so, like Katie had it on her finger right up there and it was staying still. Um, so that's, if they're staying still, that's a good way to, you know, blend in with the sticks or the trees that they are on. However, if they would like to move, they have to mimic the motion of the tree so they're not conspicuous or super visible. Which means they'll kind of, like, move like this. Like, they'll kind of move in a swaying motion, almost like a chameleon. If you've ever seen a chameleon walk around, or like on planet Earth, or any one of those documentary series, they kind of move with the wind to look like they're swaying in it, and that helps them blend in with the natural environment that they're in. And these guys are also primarily nocturnal, which does make it harder for any of their uh, predator species that aren't bats um, <laughs> to see them moving around at night. So during the day at the zoo when you guys are visiting here, they're not going to be super active and moving around with the exception of this lady right here. She's <laughs> very much awake. Um, but these guys are primarily nocturnal critters. Does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, inquiries, anything along those lines of walking sticks or about walking sticks? Or invertebrates. Or invertebrates as a whole. Praying. Okay, praying mantis is still on my head. All right. Hello, Joanne. Good morning. All right. All right. So, if you guys have any comments, questions, concerns, inquiries, anything along those lines about walking sticks, feel free to pop them in at any time. We will continue to answer them. However, we are going to bring out 
our next invertebrate friend, Emily's favorite. My favorite. So we're still we're still working on these guys. I have to get like trained as everybody else does at the zoo here, like three times of exposure on each of like the education animals, which are the animals that we use for programs like this, as well as in-person programs at the zoo. So you have to, you know, handle them and take them out of their enclosures three times before you're completely checked off on them. Minimum. Minimum. And uh, we're still I'm getting there. I'm Ooh. getting there with these guys. It's the slowest process. I'm actually the most chill with the last animal that we're going to have out here than these guys, which seems very backwards to me. And I don't understand why it is. But that's just it's it's how it is, and we're gonna go with it. Um, so, how do they breed Nioka walking sticks? Okay, great question. so this is a super great question, and I am very happy to answer it again. Yeah. Um, so, they have two methods of breeding. Um, they have parthenogenesis, which basically means that the females can lay unfertilized eggs if there are no males around to fertilize the eggs. However, the only catch to this is any unfertilized egg will be a female. So, if there are multiple years with no males to mate with for you know, maybe males are getting eaten more than females by predators or something like that, you will have successive generations of only females, which could be detrimental to a population. However, if there is a male around to fertilize the eggs, there's only a 50-50 shot that the fertilized egg will be a male. So just because the egg is fertilized just doesn't guarantee the sex coming out as a male. It's only if the egg is laid unfertilized that it is guaranteed to come out as a female. And one of the only vertebrates that has parthenogenesis, or exhibits parthenogenesis, is the Komodo dragon in Indonesia, which is crazy. Yes. However, it is becoming, there are more studies happening, especially among reptiles. And there are there's a few species of lizards also, like the Komodo dragon, who are exhibiting this. Um, I think there's a whole species that's entirely parthenogenic. I think so. Which also, again, like she said, leaves them vulnerable to change, just because there's very few um, new genetics in the population. Um, but also... There was a um, python, I think a reticulated python, in a London in the London Zoo a few years ago, who also just cloned herself and yeah. had like five different babies, which yeah. is really cool. Super cool. Cool. All right. So we're gonna talk about the animals that I have issues with. They're cockroaches, <laughs> specifically they're Madagascar hissing cockroaches. They um, are, as most species of cockroaches are. A very misunderstood and very um, there's many negative feelings towards these animals. They just freak people out, including me. That's understandable. Uh, which, like, it's understandable. They're they're kind of they're large as far as cockroach species go, and you know cockroaches in and of themselves don't have the greatest reputation on the planet. Um, but they are still very important critters, and it's super important that we talk about them and that we give them the love that we give every other animal, <laughs> hence why they're here today. So these guys are Madagascar hissing cockroaches. Um, there is a whole like group, a whole family of hissing cockroaches. As the name suggests, these guys are from the island of Madagascar, which is just off the east coast of Africa, kind of down by Mozambique in South Africa in the Indian Ocean. And this is the only place in the world where this species of hissing cockroach is found. So they are completely endemic to Madagascar. It's a very unique group of cockroaches. Um, so they are also arthropods. Their segmentation is a lot easier to see than on the walking sticks. So you can see the segmentation on the tops of their bodies. Um, that is the defining characteristic of being an arthropod. These guys, they can be anywhere from two to three inches long. They do not weigh a lot. They only weigh about 0.8 ounces. Um, so they're extremely light, um, and they can live up to 18 months. So for an insect, they actually have a fairly long lifespan. Um, like I said, they're found in Madagascar, um, along with 20 other species of wow. hissing cockroach. That's crazy. Yes. Um, so they're actually a fairly new species to science. Um, hissing cockroaches were discovered in 1973. The whole group um, was discovered in 1973. Um, and so they're a fairly new species to science. As a result of this, nine out of the 20 species within the hissing cockroach family um, weren't actually recognized as their own individual species um, up until very recently. Now, Neoka has a question. How did they come to be in Montana? How did they come to be in Montana, Miss Katie? <laughs> they, I think, so Madagascar hissing cockroaches are... Uh, pretty common amongst people who have reptiles as feeding bugs. Um, they're also just a cool bug to have as a colony just because they're pretty interesting. Um, they will talk about what they eat here soon, I'm guessing. 
Um, but I think our collection was originally um, raised as a colony of feeding bugs, um, and they also became a really valuable educating animal. Uh, so that's why we have them here at the zoo. Uh, I'm trying to get the camera to focus on it. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. That's cool. Um, so yeah, you know, that's pretty much why we have them here. These guys aren't native to Montana. They wouldn't survive a Montana winter, um, but that's why we have them here at the zoo. They are partly a feeder colony for the other animals at the zoo and also as educators. Thanks for the question. Okay, so these guys are super crucial to the ecosystem as gross as we want to think that they are, and it is, like, <laughs> useless as we like to think that they are. They're very crucial to the functioning of the forest ecosystems on the island of Madagascar. These guys are detritivores, which basically means that they eat all of the dead and decomposing material on the forest floor. And without detritivores, you would essentially get a buildup of all of this dead organic material, and it would quite literally, like, choke the forest. And so these guys are very important species, and they keep the forest functioning as it should. Um, so they'll eat decomposing plant and fruit matter, tree bark, things of that nature. Um, these guys are also very, very large, as you can see, and many animals on the island of Madagascar do deem them quite tasty. Uh, particularly lemurs love to give these guys a little snacky snack. Um, they're Probably crunchy and weird and gross, but I'm not a lemur, so I, you know, I don't know. I can't speak to that. But <laughs> lemurs love these guys. Um, mm. They're a very important prey species um, for the like larger animals on the island of Madagascar. Now, like the walking sticks, these guys' reproduction is also super weird and super cool. So when you think of invertebrates and you think of bugs, you don't think of them bearing live young, like the same way that we do. And then these Madagascar hissing cockroaches are like, oh, surprise, <laughs> I'm here. And they give birth to, or they, get, they bear live young. So when the female is gravid, which is basically just the invertebrate word for pregnant, um, she actually has the cocoon-like egg sac called the ofeca. Oh, look, we actually have a picture of it right here. Oh, one, one fell. That's okay, we have live ones out. Uh, so... I don't know if the glare will be too much, um, but this right here, oh, maybe, maybe, there, you go. there we go. This right here is the ofeca, or the egg sac, and so the female will carry that inside of her body while she is gravid, and then they will hatch inside of her body, and she will actually give birth to live young. She can give up, or give birth to up to 60 individuals, um, and these individuals are called nymphs when they are young. And these nymphs will go through a series of six molts, um, or instars is what it's also called Ooh. in invertebrates. Um, thank you to Ariana, my entomology friend at Michigan State University, for teaching me that fun word if you are watching. Bless you. Um, <laughs> so they molt six times, or they go through their six instars. Um, once they have gone through their sixth instar, they are deemed sexually mature and an adult Madagascar hissing cockroach. Once they're adult, they will not molt anymore. So it's only the nymphs that molt. The adults will stay the same um, for the rest of their lives. They will not molt anymore. Um, this process takes about, I think it says two years? I don't know why I think I have that thing in my head. I don't have it written down, so maybe that is false, but I will Google <laughs> that. Um, I feel like it's a I think fairly... it's like 18 months. I feel like it's a decent chunk of time that these for nymphs have to go through the molting process um, before they are deemed an adult. Now, as I've said before, there are many negative connotations surrounding the family of roaches as a whole, and that is not um, exempt to these guys. These guys often fall under the negative connotations of that follow this family of roaches. However, 99% of cockroach species are not pests, which basically means 99% of cockroach species don't inhabit human <laughs> dwellings. Basically, it's that one percent that like ruins it Gives for everybody all the a bad other ones. Wrap. Um, <laughs> one bad apple. And so these guys, if they're not, you're not going to find them in your houses. Even if you do live on the island of Madagascar, they're not going to bother you. They don't care about you. They're like, I don't want to eat the dead things on the forest floor. That's all I want. And so, 99% of roach species don't do you any harm. Just keep that in mind next time you see a cockroach. Um, these guys, like our walking sticks, are primarily nocturnal, meaning they will come out primarily at night to munch on the foods, and this probably is an adaptation 
um, that keeps them safe from their predators like lemurs. They're too close. Um, these guys are super cool in that the species exhibits sexual dimorphism, which is basically a super fancy science way of saying that males and females look different. Now, many species exhibit sexual dimorphism. One of the like most iconic ones is if you think of like elk or deer, right? The males are going to have those huge racks of antlers on their heads, and the does or the females will not. Same thing with like African lions, right? The males have the mane, and the females do not. So those are examples of sexual dimorphism. In the cockroaches, the males, much like elk or moose or deer or bison, um, technically bison, come here, um, they have horns. So um, Katie's going to try and get a male. Do I have to hold on? Get me one. Okay. Come here. Take that one. That one's moving. Okay. Come here, friend. <laughs> <laughs> We're fine. We're fine. This is the male. Okay, so Katie's got the male. I got the lady. So I'm going to get it out of the frame. Um, oh, almost did focus. So the males have okay, not helping, little boy. horns, and hopefully you can still hear me. The males have horns, or these little bumps, false horns, on the top of their carapace, which is the top of their shell-like casing. There we go. Briefly, you can see those little horn-like things. His head is actually underneath that, but that's the male. They have those little protrusions that look like horns. I'm trying to do air quotes here. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's not. So the males have these horns, and they actually serve a purpose for the male cockroaches. So like in many other um, vertebrate species like bison that have horns, right, the males use them in male-to-male -male combat during the rut um, and all that kind of stuff. And the same thing kind of applies, oh, you're going to switch them out. And the same thing kind of applies to, for, sorry, sorry, I'm cool, I'm controlled. Um, and the same thing also kind of happens for these guys. Um, males will fight in male-male combat. Um, for like territory or just general angstiness um, and they will use those horns as like their weapons for these fights. So here's the female. Let me see if I can get on the camera there. There we go. See, so there's not really any big bumps like there were on the males. It's kind of hard to tell, but almost there. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, you can see. There's just not, there's barely anything on hers. <laughs> um, and so now we get to talk about, after since we've talked about the male-male combat, we get to talk about why these guys are called hissing cockroaches. Um, so they have these holes on the sides of their body um, that are called spiracles. And you can kind of see them when you look at them up close. Um, they're those little black holes all on their carapace on the top there. Yeah. Those are called their spiracles, and they're literal, literal holes. And they will actually expel air, so they'll go, they'll like expel the air out through those spiracles and make that characteristic hissing noise. Um, and males, when they do these male to male combats, the winner will actually hiss a lot more than the loser, which probably sends an auditory signal to the rest of the colony that, like, hey, that's the male who won, like, he's the stronger dude. <laughs> um, females and nymphs, they will not hiss unless they are disturbed. Um, so that's kind of a way that you can tell males from females in addition to using those horns. Um, males will hiss after territorial combat, whereas females and nymphs will only hiss if they are disturbed, um, which is pretty cool. Does anybody have any questions, comments, inquiries <laughs> on roaches? On Emily's favorite insect. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> I love them. While we're waiting to see if anybody... Oh, where did I put it? It's right here. Oh, thank you. While we're waiting to see if anybody has any questions, my favorite thing about them, we talk about how they're detritivores, and the reason that's important, again, not only to prevent, like, suffocation of the forest floor, but bacteria and other things like that will also, you know, eat trees and break those down. But rainforests are notorious for not having a lot of nutrition in their soils, partly because of the rain, which washes out all of the nutrition, but also because there's so many plants taking up as much nutrients out of the soil as possible. So when a tree dies, all of that nutrients is stuck inside that tree. And again, bacteria can very slowly break that down over time. But these guys increase that speed tenfold, if not more. And that helps return those nutrients to the soil faster so new plants can grow. Uh, we have a new question. Ooh. How big do the colonies get? Really good question. I honestly don't have a number for you. Our colony at Zoo Montana is actually really big. Um, we have them all in one aquarium. It's pretty good sized. 
and it's uh, you know Emily's favorite place to look because there's literally hundreds of them. I would not. <laughs> she said it's disgusting if you didn't hear her. Um, I would not be surprised if they are in the hundreds um, in the wild. But also a lot of that I I don't have the answer. Maybe your friend Ariana would have the answer. But uh, yeah. um, but I do know that in general the more more food there is, the more animals there are across most animal species. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was, you know, thousands in a colony, if there's enough space and enough food. And Emily's looking it up. And it's probably how big they get. Yeah, I don't. Well, we will look it up and spend more time doing it after this. She'll ask her and friend then, who's an entomologist. Yeah, I'll ask my friend who's an entomologist, and they actually use these same insects for their, like, outreach programs. Um, so we'll see if we can get information on that, because that's actually a pretty cool question. Yeah, and thank I you. I really know that. So, yeah, all right. Are you all ready for the last? And for some reason, the one invert that I'm, like, coolest with. <laughs> and the one that I have the hardest time with, even though she's wonderful. She's great. Um, so our next, our last animal of the day is the Chilean rose-haired tarantula. Oh. Emily loves her. I, I love her, too. She's beautiful, and she's very calm, and the only reason I can hold her is because she's very calm. I have a thing for tarantulas, and by thing, I mean I freak out, um, which is why even on me in a fake form, you don't see a, a tarantula. I have ants on me, but I or on me, but I don't have any tarantulas. I can't handle it. I probably would have seen it in the, in the reflection here and freaked myself out. So, uh, <laughs> I can hold her. She's wonderful, but I don't. She's not my favorite animal. Look how cool she is, though. I will tell you about how cool she is, because I think they are super fascinating. So, again, they are the rose hair tarantula, also just sometimes called the rose tarantula or the Chilean fire tarantula. She is not super bright right now, uh, as in colored. She's perfectly bright for a spider. Um, but I mean that she is not super bright colored right now, because we think she's getting ready to molt, um, which we'll talk about here soon. Probably in the next month or two, we're thinking. Uh, now these guys, she's actually six years old. Um, in the wild, um, female tarantulas can live like 20, 25 years. Males live like five to 10, maybe if they're lucky. Um, and we'll talk about why for that as well a little bit later. Um, so they're found in Chile and Argentina and Bolivia. So um, on the I can't, western, West, yeah. western end of South America, um, they are mostly a desert or like dry grassland area animal. Um, and they're semi-fossorial. Uh, meaning they spend a good amount of their time underground. Um, the reason for that, um, these guys are not build the web in a tree kind of spiders. Um, they're actually extremely delicate. So climbing up on a big area and then potentially falling is not good for them. They, if they fall, they could actually break their um, exoskeleton and they can actually die that way. Um, so these guys build their webs sort of underground. It's kind of like a funnel web spider, but a little bit different. Um, they kind of build a web so they find a hole in the ground. Either they dig it on their own or they find like an unused rodent hole. And then they will lay some webbing out in front of the hole. Or right, there's my hands. Okay, lay some webbing out and then they'll take some webbing down inside so that it's like a trip wire. So anything walking across that will let her know something's out and then she can run out and grab her food. Now her food is obviously mostly invertebrates, other invertebrates, like smaller spiders. They can get beetles and all sorts of bugs like centipedes and things like that. But occasionally, she is pretty good sized. She can actually occasionally eat things like small mice, or small lizards, or even small frogs. So uh, they are pretty amazing predators. Now, whoops, pardon our radio there. There we go. Um, so <laughs> it's really cool. Um, spiders don't drink blood. However, they do this really weird thing where um, their venom, so by the way, don't worry about Emily, um, their venom is about equivalent to a bee sting. It's not really going to harm a human or even a large mammal, uh, but she does have some pretty sick fangs. Um, so that part would hurt, but she wouldn't, Emily wouldn't die from <laughs> being bitten by this spider. <laughs> um, but part of that venom is actually a digestive enzyme. And a digestive enzyme means it breaks down something to be eaten. So when she injects that venom into an insect or into another uh, smaller animal, it basically turns their insides into a smoothie. And they slurp it out. And they slurp it out. So while she doesn't suck blood, she does suck out the insides usually of an animal. And actually some spiders will put their digestive enzymes on the outside of their animal. So it like breaks down the chitin and all the other parts of another insect's in the exoskeleton. And then they'll slurp that up too. It's really gross and really cool at the same time. 
Um, she actually has... What is it? She can so, eat mice. <laughs> Megan, thank you for that question. Yeah, isn't it insane? Probably smaller mice, I would think. Yeah, I, I what I've Googled is that they use their like their large size to subdue prey. How they do that in the first place was extremely unclear. When I read a comment like that, I imagine like a tarantula dropping out of a tree <laughs> and just like flopping on this mouse <laughs> and subduing it that way. Does that probably actually happen? No. Um, so I have no idea how they actually do that, unless it's a matter of the mice trips the wire for this web, the tarantula comes out, and bites. bites it, and then once, you know, the bite is, like, shocking for the mice, um, the mouse, it's able to, like, climb on top of it and kind of subdue it that way. I've also seen, you know, baby mice that are fairly, re baby mice take a while to grow. Baby mice are, like, this big. Like, m my thumb pad, barely. Um, so, and these guys are semi-fossorial, so they go into a rodent den and mama mouse is out. That might be how they eat mice. That would be my guess is the most common way that they eat mice, but we're not entirely sure. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, spiders have eight legs, right? And fun fact, when you're drawing a spider, um, spiders have two body parts. They have the abdomen and they have the cephalothorax, which is a fancy Latin word for head chest. Um, and their legs are attached to the cephalothorax, not to the butt end. Um, but when you count these limbs, you're probably going to come up with ten. Because she has two little front arms. And if you can turn her to the camera, or I can switch by so you can get closer, we'll get closer. I'm going to go around the other way. Oh, yeah. I'm holding her. I'll, I'll switch over here. Cool. Okay, good. I'm also, let's see. I think you're on the right side. Yeah, there you go. So those two shorter legs up in the front are actually called, they're little appendages oh God, I'm called. Backwards. There we go. There you go. The little appendages called pedipalps, and that just means hands, basically. Um, and then her fangs are also kind of considered appendages. They're called chelicerae, um, and so she's got her um, eight legs, and then she's got the little pedipalps, and then she's got fangs. So they're pretty intense. They're super cool, and I do like them a lot. Um, they are just a little scary for me. <laughs> um, now, another fun fact, um, they can have anywhere between 50 and 200 babies depending on how, how much food there is in an area and how much energy they have to contribute to babies. Um, also, the reason why males don't live super long is because the males die after mating, which is, you know, why they don't live very long. Females can live 25 years, males get like 5 to 10, maybe. No, sorry, he's not on the camera. There you go. You can see. Okay, I'll put this under your hands. So you yeah, there we go. Uh, not quite. Not quite. <laughs> well, she's uh, on both my arms now, so that's where she's going to hang out. <laughs> Do you need help? <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can like try and rotate her onto one, but I don't, think she's, I don't think she's feeling that right now. She's just walking towards she's you. Just, I wouldn't be able to handle that. Ooh, okay. There she is. Anyway, <laughs> I can bask in all of her glory. I feel like your arm. elbows are double jointed. Oh, they are. Oh, okay, that's why that looks like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we're gonna come back to invertebrates that don't have double joints, um, like Emily's elbows. Um, this here is t Taboo's last shed. It looks like it moved just because I moved it. It is not an animal that is alive. It is basically like the shed skin of a snake. Uh, this is her last shed from October of last year, not 2018, uh, 2019, 2018. Uh, so it's been a little since she shed, but that is the exoskeleton that we're talking about. Would you like some help? Um, I'm going to use this as my arm workout for the day. Cool. So as long as you guys can see her, I think we're, we're going to keep her here for, <laughs> for a while. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. So a lot of people are scared of spiders, including me, and that's totally fair. Um, but most of the time, spiders, snakes, all the animals that we're afraid are going to bite us are fairly unlikely to bite us because they don't want their face near something that they consider dangerous, right? So it's kind of their last resort. And again, her venom's not very strong on us anyway. It'd be a waste of her energy to in bite us and get rid of that venom, right? Because that venom takes energy to make. Um, so she actually has a couple other strategies or adaptations that she uses to try to get rid of predators. The very first thing she's going to do is try to make herself look scarier, if that were possible. Um, so what they do is they actually will stand up on their back four legs and rear up and like show off their fangs and wave around their top legs and just generally look very terrifying. I would not be able to handle that, but they're super cool. Um, and then if that doesn't work, they will actually butt end towards, like if you were the predator, right? The butt end is towards you right now. Um, she would use her back legs to kick off those nice fuzzy little hairs all over her body. Those little fuzzy hairs actually feel like velvet when you touch her, um, but when they get into the air, they get into the eyes and the nose and the mouth, and they're very itchy. 
Um, so it would hopefully deter a predator, or at least distract them long enough for her to run away and get into her burrow and stay safe. And then finally, again, if she uh, can't um, get them away or anything, she might try to bite too. So that's the last resort for most animals, including spiders, most of them anyway. Um, we don't have tarantulas, well, tarantulas are on most continents. We don't have them here in Montana, but we do have the very nicely large wolf spider. Um, again, not like the best dealing with spiders here. And then I was at an event uh, a few months ago, and someone was like, hey, come look at this. Can you identify this? And I was like, oh, it's got to be like a bird or something like that. And I walk over, I get within like five feet, right? Didn't have my glasses on, first mistake. I didn't even have them on my head. I think they were sitting somewhere else. And it was a wolf spider that I was like this big, almost as big as Taboo. And I like ran away at the speed of light. So we do have large wolf spiders here in Montana. They are pretty fuzzy, but no actual tarantulas, I believe. Uh, which I actually heard, or I was Googling up fun facts for her, because we're going to be doing an animal spotlight on Taboo <gasps> in May on some Friday. I don't remember the date. I feel like it's the 18th. On we're going to do it on Facebook. We're yeah. going to be doing an animal spotlight on her in a couple of weeks. So I was Googling facts for that. Um, and I feel like the name tarantula uh, came from the Italian word tarantella, it did. which is actually a dance. Yeah. Um, it's a very difficult dance. Um, but yeah, that's where the name tarantula originated, is from an Italian dance called the tarantella. Alright, so Nyoka says, my brother loves her. He had one, not sure if it's the same kind, and named her Harry. She loved his wife's hairbrush. That is so cool. I love it. <laughs> um, and then, is that common for most spiders to act scarier? Um, I don't think so. I think most spiders try to run away and hide, uh, because we are giants. Uh, and yes, many spiders, not actually, not even many, but several spiders do have venom that can harm humans. However, most of the time spiders are like, oh my god, that thing is like a million times bigger than me, I need to run away. So I don't think it's a very common thing, and I honestly don't even know if she would, um, in the wild, if she would do that to a human. She'd probably do that to a smaller carnivore like a fox or a coyote or something, but I don't know that she would do that to a human. She'd be like, okay, I'm out of here, bye, <laughs> and hopefully run away. I think that's more common than um, acting scarier. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, my friends? All right, we'll let that come up for a second and see if anyone has any questions. We do appreciate you guys watching. Um, we know insects are not everyone's favorite. However, um, I do... Um, Can you be of assistance while you chat? Yes. Throw away. Thank you. <laughs> come here, little one. I have to get tired. There we go. Okay. See, she's very nice and I can hold her. Just a little front view for you. That's actually her underside. She's like, what are you doing? Um, and then her little spinneret is actually pretty obvious on the back here. It's kind of, oh, there we go. So a little black two spot. Two little prongy things. Two little prongs there. She's really cool. She's a nice little spider. Okay, I'm going to put she her back She's a good now. lady. Oh, no, I just had my favorite fact first. Oh, wait, hold on. Okay. Like I said, I do like them. They're just kind of terrifying. Okay, so... I don't know if it will focus enough for you to see this. Oh, yeah. Oh, almost. Okay. So, on the tips of their toes, tarantulas have claws, retractable claws like cats. And so that's what allows her to go like this and hold on to me when my hand is vertical. Um, so they, they, I don't think this camera is good enough, but there's tiny little itty retractable claws there. You can kind of see them. And then when she picks up her foot, they go back inside her foot. And that's how she's able to hold on. Coolest fact ever. Okay. Now we can put her back. <laughs> All right. Does anybody Perfect. have any questions about any of the uh, amazing and interesting inverts that you have met this morning? Also, by no means are we experts, which is why I want you guys to go look up the Missoula Butterfly House and Insectarium. They have an amazing Facebook where they've been doing other um, insect and invertebrate encounters. And they are so cool. They have so many cool insects. They have such cool videos. They do little encounter videos like two or three or four or five times a week. It's really awesome. So go check them out. Um, I believe they have an Instagram as well that's really neat. And they learn, you can learn all sorts of really fun facts about insects. So check them out. Um, we'll also be shouting them out on Tuesday so you can learn more a little bit about them. And check out their Facebook page too. So also... Today, by the way, is the start of National Parks Week. Woo! So we're going to do a whole week of posts on Facebook about national parks. Um, and so keep, keep watching our page for that. My brain's running out of fuel right now. But we hope you guys enjoyed this one. Thank you guys so much for watching. And tune in next week. We have a fun surprise next week. So see you next week. Bye, you guys. Toodaloo. <laughs>